Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Lisa Lunghofer. I'm the executive director of the Gray Muzzle Organization. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Amanda Grant, my wave Amanda, and Laura Merrick. Um, and we're really excited to have Denise Fleck, our Gray Muzzle Board President, here presenting today. So before I go ahead and introduce her, just a little housekeeping. We will have time for questions at the end, so please feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A box if you're joining us on Zoom or if you're joining us on Facebook Live, please feel free to enter your questions in the comments and Amanda and Laura and I will field those and toss them over to Denise and hopefully she can give you some, some great answers. And, and if we don't get to all the questions, I think she'll probably um, offer some contact information so that you can follow up with her. All right, so with that, let me tell you a little bit about Denise. Denise Fleck is an award-winning author and animal care instructor who developed the curriculum for her pet first aid and CPR and pet disaster preparedness classes after training with dozens of schools and organizations, practicing, attending seminars, and practicing some more. Known as the Pet Safety Crusader, Denise has personally taught more than 15,000 humans life-saving skills and has appeared on Animal Planet's Groomer Has It and Pit Boss, A&E's Kirstie Alley's Big Life, CBS TV's The Doctors, CNN Headline News, PBS TV's Lassie's Pet Vet, and KTLA Los Angeles, as well as on radio and in magazines. She's president of the board of Gray Muzzle Organization, and she has a soft spot for senior dogs. And we honestly have a soft spot for Denise. She is a, a, just a marvelous human, and we are so thankful that she's part of the, the Gray Muzzle team. And so I'm just delighted to turn the floor over to you, Denise, and thank you so much for presenting for us today. My pleasure. Thank you, Lisa. And of course, Laura and Amanda, we couldn't do it without teamwork. That's what it's all about. And we're here to help those senior dogs thrive. So today we're going to talk about seasonal changes and how they may affect our senior dogs. And I may just throw in a smidgen of pet first aid as we go, if it seems appropriate at times. So just yesterday, we turned that corner from summer into autumn. And personally, I like the, the changing you know, of the seasons, the colorful fall foliage, the nip in the air, which we definitely got today. But sometimes when something goes on a long time, it does tend to bring some people down. And in three months from now, we're going to go into winter. So we really are into that darker half of the year. And during that, many humans actually do scientifically proven experience a mood shift due partially to the colder temperatures, but also because there's less daylight. And when there are less daylight hours, our brain produces more melatonin, which is the sleep maker and it produces less serotonin, which is the happy chemical in our bodies. These chemical changes actually manifest into something we call SAD, seasonal affective disorder. And many people get kind of sluggish, low energy. Some don't wanna eat, some wanna eat way more. Um, and some even feel sad. So this is kind of, you know, what happens to some people at this time of the year, we feel sluggish and we want to do nothing more than hibernate. So that's what seasonal affective disorder is. But the question is, do these seasonal changes also affect our pets? The answer, maybe. <laughs> no one knows for sure. And according to, as you see here, Steve Dale, who is a certified animal behavior consultant, but is also one of Gray Muzzle's advisory board members. Um, you know, he just says maybe no one knows for sure. Since dogs and humans share much of the same brain chemistry, it's possible they could get sad too. But there just is really no objective way to diagnose this condition in pets. We don't get the feedback from them in terms that we can adequately um, assess. <laughs> um, th this this 
squirrels just making me uh, have a, a pleasant smile because of actually of one of our board members who rescued one in the last few days. But um, like their wilder cousins are pet dogs, maybe slowing down to store energy um, and create fat reserves. That may be something that went back to the wolf days. Um, this seems to work well for bears, for penguins, for you know our little furry creatures like the squirrel here where they're gathering nuts, storing up for the winter. Um, but maybe since we're playing with our dogs less, giving them less opportunities to go outdoors than we did in the summer, maybe they become bored and we're taking that as lethargic. Maybe because they're not doing things and having a lack of both physical and mental stimulation, they may be sens sensing our mood or they, or excuse me, or they may be sensing our mood and mimicking it. They often mirror our own um, moods ourselves. Animals are so perceptive to our emotions. That's why in my pet first aid classes, I'm always telling people, you know, rule number one is to stay calm in order to better help the pet. Not the brightest picture here, but I just want you to see my senior girl, Kiko. And what she loves doing is she, her spot is in the dining room where there's this low window, very often her chin's resting and she's watching chipmunks out that window. But when the chipmunks stop um, running around out there and there's no activity in the cul-de-sac, I will find Kiko sound asleep on her side in that same spot. So it's all about that stimulation um, as far as keeping them busy goes. Now to get a little bit scientific, there have been studies done on grass rats and hamsters that may actually shed some light as to whether our dogs are affected by seasonal affective disorder. When the rodents receive less sunlight on their brain, the hippocampus, that's the part of the brain there that's um, responsible for learning and memory, actually shrinks. So um, there does definitely seem to be a connection. Something else that we can actually observe semi-scientifically about our dogs is that what is called light responsive or seasonal flank alopecia. Many of the Northern breeds, the Huskies, the Malamutes, the Akitas, the Chow Chows, a lot of the ones that fall into the Spitz category of dogs, um, many of them will start losing fur due to the lack of sunlight on the pineal gland. Again, that's something in the brain, um, the tiny little gland. And what most people, I shouldn't say most people, scientists aren't really completely sure what it does, but one thing they do know it does is it regulates melatonin. And melatonin, again, is that sleep maker. So that lack of sun really, you know, has an effect on um, the brain and it's exhibiting itself in different ways in that sluggishness. And here in the case of um, what's called seasonal flank alopecia or light responsive alopecia. Now, this was my beautiful lady bonsai of many years ago, and I will say she did not have this disorder, so to speak, but boy, did she blow coat like this. Um, this wasn't unusual, you know, twice a year for me to have to do this um, all the time. But I'm just trying to let you know that there is some science that relates to humans. And, you know, we can then extrapolate that as the days get shorter, like they are right now, when we get into days with less sunlight, things may be changing in our dogs too. But even if that isn't the case, they're often mirroring our own moods. So the best way to put the sunshine back into their lives is to put it into ours. And I think this is a picture that requires no explanation. If I'm lazy, so is my dog. <laughs> so the idea is especially, you know, having older best friends who march to a slower drum beat like some of us do now anyway ourselves, it's important that we do these four things as we get into those darker parts of the year, because all of these things pertain to us as well. And the first one is to engage our dogs indoors, do more things indoors together, be in the moment with them. It's also great if we can improve our indoor lighting, if we can go outdoors when we can, when the weather allows it, and yep, doggone number four there, watch the diet. So let's talk about each of those four things a little bit. 
Really, I want you to be in the moment with your pets like they are with us. Um, hide toys and treats around the house to encourage their hunting instincts. I know there are several generations removed from you know, their wilder cousins, but um, just seeing them do some of that searching and using their noses, which again stimulates their brains can be awesome. Um, take part in the game, you know, yourself, be there watching them. Don't just be a silent observer, but, you know, really enjoy the fun they're having. There are all kinds of things on the market. I'm going to show you a, a list of things too, you know, foraging mats, puzzle games, um, just anything to keep their brains stimulated and keep yours as well. Brushing and massaging is kind of a more passive thing for the dogs, but for our senior dogs, those can be wonderful activities. Um, it increases circulation. It helps to flush um, toxins out of the lymph glands. The brushing will distribute the oils throughout the skin and the coat. And you know, the skin is the largest organ of the body. So it's important that it's getting the circulation it needs. But then there are times where you can just be together with your senior best pal, sitting, watching the snow fall, um, sitting by the fireplace and watching fireplace and watching it crackle, obviously from a safe distance, Pet Safety Crusader and me is going to come out here, or just sniffing all the scents the season has can be really rewarding for both you and your pet. So here, are, like I said, are a few things I'm just going to go through, but hide treats. And you don't have to have one of these fancy mats. Just take a towel or a blanket, put a couple of treats down in the line, roll up that towel a little bit more, a few more, roll it up and, you know, place it there for your pet. Encourage them. They don't always understand what it is we want them to do right away. So, you know, make a treat accessible to them and then maybe flip the blanket a little bit so that they see another one. But the idea of them learning to move that blanket, seeking out that treat can be a great stimulating activity. Of course, you can buy things, you can play, go find it, hiding something in the house, but a lot of those take a little bit more time. But heck, we've got three months of autumn and three months of winter. You definitely can teach an old dog new tricks during that time. And you probably should just for that reason. Um, like it says there, I, I got ahead of myself, but yes, you can. You can teach your dog to ring a bell by the door when he wants to go out. You can teach him to fetch your slippers. The, the ideas are limitless. And when you have a senior dog, when you're teaching them to fetch these things, it's probably less likely you're going to get chewed up slippers, but you might get them delivered in one or two pieces. Help him learn the names of his toys. I had a dog named Rex. He was a Border Collie Akita, and he was amazing. Now, they do say Border Collies are great at learning words, but this doggy, um, we would say, go fetch your squirrel, Rex, and he'd bring the stuffed squirrel. Go fetch your frog. He'd bring the stuffed frog. It was a great thing that we taught him, and he caught on very quickly. There are some dogs that may take a little bit longer to do that, but it's all about our persistence and our consistency. And you don't need your dog to do tricks, but the idea is that you're doing something together and it's keeping his brain sharp. That's what it's all about. Now, as far as building an indoor obstacle course, if you have you know, a downstairs basement that isn't used for anything else, sure, that might be great. I put that in there because that's on a lot of lists. It's not something that's probably gonna happen in my household. But I mean, you know, even if you get like those tunnels and teach them to run through something safely, the idea again is just to you know, be in the moment with the dog and keep him busy. Now that second to the last bullet, I'm sure you hear a ding, 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 ding going off. And I hope my three gray muzzle counterparts here, Lisa, Laura, and Amanda are patting me on the back for that one. But you know, the greatest way to keep a senior dog busy is to adopt another senior dog, another one of his peeps, so to speak, that he can commiserate or rejoice with and that they keep each other busy. But of course, you know, we all need to know and tune into our pets and realize, you know, that sometimes some animals do great as only kids. 
So you got to don't push the envelope if that's not, you know, going to fit your lifestyle either, because we all hear those horrible stories about people wanting to adopt, but then for whatever reason, they didn't have time, they didn't have the energy, they didn't have the, the, the ability in some fashion, and then that dog needs to find a new home. So always do your research, think things through really well before you make these kind of decisions. But if it is a good fit for you and your senior pet, that's always a great one. And then, like I said there, just do something together. Now, I'm gonna show you a short video um, to, to kind of demonstrate that dogs learn by doing. Uh, one of the things I'm always talking about in pet disaster preparedness is to write down your emergency plan. Um, you know, people think they may have things in their head, but in the second and the third and the fourth drafts, we always, you know, come up with new things we had forgotten previously. But the thing is, I don't care how many drafts you've done, <laughs> the, the, the dog isn't going to read it. <laughs> and um, obviously, we're getting a delivery of some sorts. Uh, let me shut the door a little bit. She's fine by herself right now. Sorry, I just want everybody to hear me. But the point is, no matter what great document you write, the dog isn't going to read it. You have to show by example. So this is not a video of a professional trick dog by any means. You're going to actually see Kiko. This is Kiko who we adopted about 11 months ago um, from a North Georgia shelter. She was, they're not sure, but somewhere between eight, nine or 10 years old. And she is just blossoming more and more each and every day. Now, at the beginning, you're going to hear me barking at my husband as I'm trying to get him to do the video right, but he did so well, and I should be kinder. I want you to be able to see the cups that I'm going to put down in front of her. Sit. Okay, Kiko, we're going to play a cup game, okay? We're going to have three cups, one cup, two cups, three cups. And she has no idea what I'm doing here. Special treats in the cup. I'm going to mix it up and see if Kiko can find the treats. Where's the treat, Kiko? Where's the treat? Which one do you think it's in? <laughs> Kiko, where's the treat? How about if I sneak another treat in here? Where's the treat? What if I put a treat on the top? Well, that worked. And then look, there are more treats. Yay, Kiko! Okay, let's try one more time. We're gonna put the treat on the floor and put the cup over it. Oh, now she knows the treat's there. Whoops, okay, if I mix it up, do you still know where the treat is? She sure does, oh, wait a minute. That is the one, you win. Good job, baby girl. Okay, so a couple things about that. Like I said, by no means was that meant to be a, a professional video of a dog doing an amazing trick. This was a dog who had never seen um, this game played before. Um, there are a lot of things that entered into that too. She was using her nose. She was, I wish I could see the wheels turning because somehow from the outside, I hope you all could, I could see her trying to figure out what it was I wanted her to do. And I actually learned a lot you know, from doing that with her. And now we've done it again and she's much quicker at it. But actually the first experience was the greatest because it's when she was, you know, having to think the hardest and really stimulating her brain. Now she did sniff each cup, which totally makes sense because I was holding the treats and I moved the cup. So even that slightest bit of treat scent was on each of the cups but it took her a little bit and then she zeroed in on the one that did have the treats when she understood. So, you know, I'm having fun with my dog here. My dog is getting treats in the end. So this all turns out to be a good thing. The only thing I will say when you do games like this is, you know, break those treats small, maybe put in um, a few little carrot slices or some other things. Initially, you may have to use those high value treats to get them to learn the games, but just be careful because we don't want to pack on the pounds. So other things you can do indoors is maybe, you know, like I said, if you have that basement, keep your pets busy down there. Maybe you can throw a Nerf ball or just walk them around with you. I used to walk around the pool for exercise 
and my dog Haiku would follow me. He just, because he got used to following me, he, you know, when we were on leash, he would follow. So maybe if you do laps in the basement, there are some places you can take your pets during the inclement weather, um, home improvement stores, just be careful about all the sharp objects. Um, sometimes pet stores, just some place to get them out and about. Go for a car ride, even though that's kind of outdoors, they're indoors, they're in the car. And um, gosh, I should have put that video in, but dogs love nothing more than a puppuccino or something through the drive through So, you know, limit those things, but just keep them active. And, you know, it's cold today. I, I shouldn't say it's cold. It's chilly today. It's been around 69 degrees where I am here, but I knew it was cold before I opened the door. You know how? Things were hurting. My knees were stiff. Um, the cold weather just exacerbates swelling and pain and overall discomfort. And it, this can happen to our senior dogs too. So always talk to your veterinarian, find out ways you can make your pets more comfortable. There are wonderful medications and supplements out there, but keeping them moving is really an important part of it. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. So find out what's appropriate for your pet and take it in stages. Don't go from zero to 60 right away. But something like if it's available in your hood, um, like hydrotherapy can be wonderful. The buoyancy of the water actually takes the, the pressure off those senior joints, allowing the movement without pain. And it can help your dogs build up strength in muscles that may have been atrophying because of non-use. Don't get me on <laughs> muscles atrophying. I, get, I guess it's been a little while since we've heard about this, but you know, a number of years ago, it was a big deal, especially for people with the little dogs to be carrying them around in their purses. And there were studies done that those little dogs just weren't walking enough. So even if you have a little dog, make him do laps in the basement, keep those muscles moving because it's so important. And we're gonna go into this in a moment, but taking off even a few pounds may make um, a big difference for your senior dog. Number two, what we can do to help our pets through these darker times of year is improve indoor lighting. Obviously that sounds like a no brainer, but the idea is the more sunlight that gets into their pupils, just like in ours, the more brain chemistry is positively effective. So move your dog's bed near a sunny window. Your senior dog has a bed, right? really, really important. It's those hard floors not only make calluses, but it, it can hurt those older bones. Don't get a bed that's too soft. Some of those nests with like cedar chips and all make it really, it's like us getting out of a beanbag chair. That's really difficult. So find something firm and supportive in a draft-free area and move it where the sun shines and can warm up those bones. On days that you can, open up the shades and let the sun shine in. And it's also a good idea to replace bulbs with full spectrum lighting. Now, I'm no scientist in regards to this at all, but this is a study done about, now, about full spectrum lighting, and that's the blue columns you see here. And see, it scientifically shows that for humans, it can improve, it can improve our mood, our mental awareness, color perception, visual clarity, productivity, scholastic performance, vitamin D production, dental health, sleep quality, and look at, they have SAD there, seasonal affective disorder. So, um, it, you know, the sun makes the, the plants grow and our flowers bloom. So hopefully it can make our brains um, shine and sparkle as well. Oh, and here's just another example of when the sun is shining, open up those doors, those drapes, those blinds, so that your pets can stay active. I mean, certainly you're, you want to conserve the heat going on in the house, but when you can open those up so that your pets can see what's going on, look what happens if I can find the little thing here. <laughs> get engaged when something's happening and I'm not going to make you enjoy this for long but they can have a really good time and they feel like they're doing a job they're protecting their homestead so you know keep those things in mind when we can however get outdoors even for short spurts of time it's going to allow our pets to exercise to socialize be exposed to the natural sunlight that really does help produce that vitamin d
After this year plus of COVID, you know, I'm sure a lot of us are um, going through a withdrawal from seeing family and friends. And I'm sure your dog is too. He's missing his sniffing buddies. So when you can get out there, you know, do so. Fresh air and sunshine does both a canine and a human body good. But we know it's not always there and available. But take advantage of it. It's a freebie. When you're out and about, though, watch out for critters and different things that are growing. As the leaves start to fall or the snow falls, um, things may be obscured. And not everyone is hibernating yet. So, you know, be very careful of the snakes. Um, know the, the venomous um, snakes in your area and realize that when the temperature's still in the high 60s, they may be out sunning themselves on a rock. When it gets a lot colder, they're going to go away. But there's still that time when that nip is in the air like today that they can still be out and about. Our, you know, little rodent friends are gathering their nuts and their food to, you know, go away from winter. Like I said, Kiko's always watching for the chipmunks. But do remember if people have rat poison and a rat has died from ingesting that, the poison may, um, may not be inert. You know, it, it may still be active. So it could hurt your pet as well. And then there are the mushrooms, things that are growing. Gosh, I saw our neighbor has a whole family of mushrooms around his mailbox today. And the good thing is that 99% of mushrooms present little or no problem for our pets. Um, as we all know, many of them can actually have powerful health enhancing benefits, but that leaves 1% that can be downright deadly. And very few of us humans know the difference between a toxic mushroom and a safe mushroom. So I have put the names here um, of two of the, the most deadly ones that our dogs are likely to ingest. Um, and the reason they typically ingest these is they actually have a very fishy odor to them. Amanita phalloids and insabi are the poisonous ones. So, you know, I, again, I'm not what you call a mycological um, expert who studies mushrooms. But do know many of these mushrooms can give our pets gastrointestinal upsets, um, vomiting, diarrhea, drooling. Um, it can even manifest itself in depression and lethargy. Some of them have that hallucinogenic um, syndrome to them. So your, your pet can literally trip out and, you know, be out of it or be doing weird things, going in circles, putting his head against the wall. Air biting is something dogs will often do um, when they're hallucinating, snapping, um, and muscle tremors, and even leading to seizures. So when you see things growing in the yard, get rid of them if they shouldn't be there for your pet's sake. And then look for other things that might be hidden. I mean, it could be great fun to rake up those leaves and you and the dog jump right into them, but make sure it's been a clean surface beforehand. That carton tools that, you know, didn't get put away before the leaves fell, aren't buried in, you know, underneath it. Nails and screws, trash and other items. So taking those walks with your senior pooch is vital, but we do want to keep him safe during those walks. So it's important to gear up. Um, you might want to get some type of booties or leggings. Yeah, I know, not all dogs are going to adapt to these things. It's all in the teaching method. And realize there's fun and stimulation even in teaching them to wear some of these things. These are, you know, a, another teaching kind of tool, but it can protect their paws from the wet ground, the snowy ground, the icy ground, from de-icing salts. All of those things I'm going to pick up on a little bit more, but they can maybe just keep your pet's paws dry, warm, and protected from the elements. So let's talk about the elements a little bit. I think we're a little bit away, but I saw that snow was falling in Pennsylvania or someplace the other day. So, you know, depending on where you live, this may come sooner rather than later. And frostbite is one of those things that, you know, if you haven't understood it, haven't experienced, haven't seen it, it's kind of a foreign thing. And I hate using food analogies with pets, but I think this makes sense. You go to the grocery store and you buy the ground beef, the ground chicken, the ground lamb, ground turkey, ground whatever it is. You look at it, it's kind of pinkish, varying degrees depending on, you know, what, what meat it is. And it's generally wrapped in cellophane that you can literally poke your finger right through into. 
you buy it, you take it home. I'm not saying to poke your finger in it at the, rest, at the grocery store, but you get the idea. It's soft and it's pink. You go home, you put it in your freezer and you pull it out a couple hours later. Whatever shade of pink it was, it's now darker and you can no longer poke at it. That's basically what happens to our pet's tissue when they get bitten, frostbitten. Um, they turn dark and hard. And the problem is our dogs don't tell us when they're starting to get numb. So we don't notice it until very often frostbite has already set in. You often think of it on the paws, that it can be the nose, the tips of the ears, the tips of the tail, the whole undercarriage, including the little private areas. So we want to be very, very careful with that. And obviously, if it's too cold for us to be out barefoot, it's too cold for our pets. Limit it just to potty breaks when it really is treacherous weather out there and keep your pets warm. Um, some pets with uh, thin coats might benefit from a sweater when they go out for a walk. Um, dogs, if it's really cold, just every once in a while, hold their ear flaps between your hands to warm them to increase that circulation. But, you know, really limit that time because we don't want to get it to the point of frostbite. But if your pet's too cold, you've come in from, you know, the cold, obviously the first step is to get them into that warm environment. And I'm a nervous ninny about electric blankets, heating pads, hot water bottles with our pets when we don't get that feedback. We can get them too hot too quick. So, you know, you can put some warm water in like in a two liter bottle if you really screw that lid back on. But I say just get some towels or blankets, throw them in your dryer on a warm setting, and then wrap your pets in that. Get them to drink some warm fluids. Probably not going to drink warm water, but maybe if you have a, a non or low sodium chicken broth, they might lap that up and it might warm them from the inside. What you want to do though with any parts that feel particularly cold is lower them. If you have a smaller pet that you can put on your lap, do so and let the paws dangle to promote circulation to those areas. We don't want to elevate, we want to promote circulation. If something's already hard, you don't want to rub it because that'll actually be painful to the pet. Um, but if you really think it is frostbite, get to veterinary care quickly. Um, I have a veterinary friend in Tahoe who's told me many a story that he has seen dogs self-mutilate from frostbite, meaning really chewing off and on their uh, paws in their tail. So if it's truly frostbite, you do want to get your pet to the vet so that he can be sedated. You don't want him to go through that defrost without the help of medications. Um, there's again, these are the kind of things we can't really get into our pet's head. But my understanding of what frostbite might feel like is we've all sat on the floor cross-legged and our legs falling asleep. And then we try to get up and sometimes it's not a big deal, but sometimes it's a wowser of one. You know, it really is an uncomfortable nerve kind of pain as that blood's rushing back. And I'm told if you take that to like the thousandth power, that's what it may feel like to a dog as he's starting to defrost. So don't let him get into that situation. There are other cold weather things we need to be a bit aware of. And there are things we do to help us around, you know, the house and the yard. One is antifreeze. And antifreeze is a colored liquid that when mixed with water actually helps to maintain an even temperature, you know, in our car's engine. It prevents corrosion and it lowers the freezing point. That doesn't sound like anything that belongs in a dog's body. And the problem is it tastes sweet. There are two different types. If you look down here at the bottom screen, propylene glycol and ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol tastes particularly sweet. And, you know, there's a whole history to this that, you know, people have been trying for decades, it seems, to get manufacturers to add a bittering agent because every year pets and wildlife die because of the sweetness they're attracted to it. And what you can see up here is it can cause acute kidney failure very quickly in your dog. And it doesn't take very much. One tablespoon is fatal in medium to large dogs, a teaspoon in small dogs. So I can't impress upon you enough to make sure if your dog gets in the garage that, that all chemicals are put away and that you watch for any leaks or spills of antifreeze. But the problem is when you're walking on the street having your happy little walk, you don't know who else's car has leaked you know, this or other chemicals. So that's why it is really important to always wash your pet's paws off 
or train them to use the booties. The icing salt is another thing we're going to encounter in these darker parts of the year. And a, depending on you know this, where your city bought it from, it can be a combination of sodium, calcium, potassium, or magnesium chlorides. These are salts. And when we think of too much salt for our dogs, typically we think of kidney problems and heart problems. And many of these de-icers also contain that ethylene glycol we just talked about. So, you know, the pets may be attracted to it or it's just gonna stick on their paws when they come back in the house. They're gonna lick and groom themselves and they're gonna ingest it. And again, the de-icing salts can, you know, erupt into kidney problems, but a, a key for you, if you're starting to notice burns to the lips or cracks to the paws, you know, that's the dehydration that's happening from the salt. And again, down there in red, you'll just notice that it doesn't take a whole lot. So obviously there are some things you can do before you get to the vet, but it's always advisable to talk to your veterinarian, to get on the phone with them and find out what you should do if you should do things such as inducing vomiting, because with certain chemicals, you're actually um, bringing what burned on the way down, burning back on the way up. So you don't always want to do that. So that's why, you know, these are just two numbers, but you should also have your veterinarian on speed dial so that if your pet gets into anything during these darker times of month, month of the year, you can actually get quick help um, so that you know what to do even before you can get to veterinary care. It's just so vital and so much a part of you know good pet parenting and being that conscientious pet parent for our senior pooches. Now, when you're out and about, like I said over and over here today, you know the daylight hours are diminished. So we want to make sure when we're out in the early morning and even in the evening, and it's not going to be about late in the evening, you know, in some parts of the country, it starts getting dark around 4.30 or so. So there could be one or two more walks definitely on the agenda each day when the sun has gone down. So you want to make sure you can be seen and that you can see along the way. So bringing along a flashlight might be a great thing, but certainly making sure your pet's harnesses or leashes are adorned with some type of headlight or reflective strips is super, super important. So there are all kinds of brands out there. You can probably get the reflective tape and add it to your own harness or leash, but just make sure you, know, you don't forget about things like that. Kika was just last night barking out from her favorite spot at um, a couple of dogs walking around our cul-de-sac and I'll tell you I could barely see them um, you know the, the darkness caught their pet parents off guard so don't be one of those be prepared and yes watch the dye when it gets cold outside some appetites actually diminish but others increase. And again, you know, that's the whole sluggishness, what, you know, not wanting to do anything. Let's, you know, go to the, the pantry or the refrigerator for us humans, but the dogs, we can limit, you know, they're, they're lucky. They may not realize it, but they're lucky because we can keep them at a healthy weight. There are actual studies that have shown pets eat more in October, November, December, January, and February than they do the whole rest of the year. Those are the cooler months. Those are also the holidays when we have all kinds of good goodies out there as well, too. So we need to be careful about restricting things. But as daylight hours do decrease and temperatures lower, animals need more energy to warm themselves. That mind fits dogs that live outdoors. Our pet dogs, our senior dogs, who you know I'm hoping beyond hope are in warm houses, don't need those extra calories in winter. So it's just so important we don't let those puppy dog eyes, even if they're senior puppy dog eyes, convince us to overfeed our dogs. Another one of our gray muzzle advisory board members, Dr. Ernie Ward, um, says here, I believe many pet parents are skeptical about the health benefits that come from their dog losing weight. They feel, so what if Fluffy is packed on a few pounds? She's happy. And I want her to enjoy whatever years she has remaining, but they are actually accelerating the demise of their beloved pet. It's actually better to have your pet a little bit underweight than a little bit overweight, particularly in their senior years. 
The Association for Pet Obesity Prevention says 53% of adult and senior dogs are overweight, yet only 22% of us humans believe it. We say, nah, you know. So we're obviously looking in different mirrors at our dogs than our vets are. And it's important that we pay attention to this, that we're so careful during the holidays when we're packing on the pounds that we're not letting our pets do so. One of Ward's colleagues, I wanted to look up this statistic I have here. One of Ward's colleagues, Alexander German of the University of Liverpool has been looking at obesity versus quality of life effects on dogs for decades and believes that as little as a 6% weight loss and show demonstrable improvements in a pet's quality of life. So what that means is if you have a hundred pound dog and he loses six pounds, it's gonna make a huge difference. Three pounds off a 50 pound dog will do the same. So about a pound and a half off a 25 pound dog or less than a pound. If you have just one of those little doggies, it can make a huge difference in their quality of life. So do keep that in mind. I know um, Dr. Ward did a webinar probably about a year ago this time, and you can find it on the Gray Muzzle website to go back to and learn more about you know, weight and how it affects our pets. But look at this guy, look at the difference. Obviously one is better than the other. Obesity can lead to reduced life expectancy and diminished quality of life. It can cause skin disorders. Like I mentioned before, the organ is the largest organ of the body. So it's obviously affected by the toxins and the inflammation that's going on that um, obesity can bring about. Um, orthopedic disease, cancer, kidney problems, and respiratory disorders can all be made better if you get your pet to lose some weight. And we're not talking de deprivation. Um, if you're thinking three quarters of a cup instead of a cup for your pet, that might make a huge difference. So little small things can make a big difference. Also during these cold winter months, I guess I didn't put a slide in here for this, but think of water. Water is you know, so, so important to every system of the body needs water. Um, dogs and people and the planet Earth are three quarters water. So wash out those water bowls daily and clean out that soap well, but make sure your dog has the, the ability to really stay well hydrated, flushing toxins that may make you sluggish. Also talk to your veterinarian. There are um, curcumin and turmeric are two herbs that actually have very potent anti-inflammatory properties. So they come in some dog treats or your veterinarian may be able to des describe, prescribe them from a um, uh, the health food store, but the right amounts for your pet's particular weight that might take some of the pain off some of the joints and things they're experiencing. And since this is also a time of year when we've got the heat on and, you know, skin is drying out, I saw something come through my email the other day, somebody trying to sell me moisturizer, but telling me how, you know, it's already fall and the heaters are on and we need to start with the eye creams. So um, we need to make sure if we haven't been doing it all along, we're getting those omega-3s and different oils in for our pets to keep their skins from drying out as well. Um, people often ask me about avocado and avocado oil can be a good thing or little bits of the flesh of avocado. Avocado is a fat, but it's the good, the, the HDL rather than the LDL. However, the pit of avocado, like of many of our stone fruits, can be dangerous because it can be a choking hazard. And there are a lot of the stone fruits, um, the seeds in the pits in peaches and plums and you know all of the things we love, those seeds contain a cyanide-like substance. So that's why they can be toxic, not the flesh itself, but the seeds. Also on the avocado, the skin can sometimes cause burning around the edges of the, your dog's mouth if he's eating it, if you're sitting under an avocado tree grazing, or um, you know, can cause an intestinal blockage. But the thing with the avocado, even though it has some good oils in it, one avocado is typically eight servings for a human. I will confess consuming an entire avocado and enjoying it, not realizing that many years ago. So with our pets with much smaller weight, we want to be so careful in the amount of you know, things we give them because it certainly could pack on the pounds.
So we're talking about all these things our pets might get into. So should they get into something they should not during this holiday season or any time of the year? Um, I just want you to be aware of, you know, a few things. Now, of course, when we're talking poisons, you need to get to the vet right away. There are diseases. Almost everything that is a pet illness has vomiting diarrhea as one of the symptoms. I'm talking here about a simple, di di simple digestive upset. Your pet eat too much, too fast, or something he should never have gotten into. So what I want you to do for first steps, arrest the stomach. If vomiting and diarrhea are coming on, whatever you're putting in is coming back out. There are two exceptions to that rule, though, is resting the stomach. If you have a diabetic pet, call your vet right away. You don't want to withhold food, especially if you've just given insulin. Also, if you're seeing blood in the vomiting or diarrhea, contact your vet right away. And, you know, in the day of age of these cell phones, um, you know, it's a great thing. I know it's kind of gross, but taking pictures at least or scooping it up in a Ziploc baggie, bringing it along is even better. But just so your pet can see, your vet can see what your pet has put out. So if it's a simple digestive upset, though, something that you don't think you need to get out of your pet's body, but it's just going to take some time to work through and you want him to feel better, stop putting the food in, encourage that water drinking. Um, you know, sometimes they won't go to the water bowl, but they might suck on a few ice cubes or ice chips. You can squirt a little bit into their mouth, or you can have these electrolyte ice cubes ready to go. Four cups water, either a tablespoon honey or sugar, and a teaspoon salt. Mix it up, put it in ice cube trays. When they form ice cubes, pop them out into a Ziploc baggie and keep that in the refrigerator. These are even great during the summer that you can pop into your pet's um, water bowl just to make sure they have those extra sugars and salts they need. But do notice, this is different from the human recipe. We would have more salt. We want to limit that salt for our pets. And then talk to your vet about what antacid is appropriate. Most vets will prescribe something called Serenia. But if your vet knows you and knows your dog, they may um, offer some over-the-counter remedies to see, you know, if the pet's okay by next morning. So something like Peps that are Mylanta, where you typically give a teaspoon for every 10 to 15 pounds the pet weighs and repeat four to six hours. Most of the time, if it was a simple digestive upset, the next morning, Fido is frisky and ready for his meal, but you're gonna to wanna to put him on a bland diet for a day or two, something like some steamed rice and boiled chicken, steamed rice and scrambled eggs, steamed rice and non-fat yogurt, something there kind of to glue things together, but that'll go down smoothly before you get him back on his diet. But work hand in paw with your veterinarian on this to make sure. If the next day he's not feeling better, I would hightail it to my veterinarian because it could be a slow acting poison or some kind of bacteria or something going on in your pet's body. And some of you may have noticed that I um, did leave Pepto-Bismol off here. There are some vets that may still recommend it, but they Pepto-Bismol, I have nothing against them personally, but they reformulated maybe five, six, seven, eight years ago, and it has a lot of salicylic aspirin. Um, salicylic acid, which is similar to aspirin in that it irritates a lot of dogs' tummies. So many veterinarians will not recommend that. But the important thing is for you to try to keep any kind of dangers out of paw's reach. Additionally, what you just really want to do is spend that quality time together. Um, studies in the future may show more of the science as to whether our dogs actually experience seasonal affective disorder like we do. But it is a given that when darkness increases, the brain produces less of the happy chemical in our bodies. So it's very um, possible that it does that for our senior dogs as well. Since they love and adore us like we do them though, they often mirror our own moods. So if we're lethargic, they may be lethargic too. And you know they become bored when there aren't things for them to do. So as the seasons change, Although we may want to sleep in or hit sack early, keeping our pets active will um, keep them in the moment and will also increase the quality of our lives as well. So I thank you guys for tuning in and wanting to be a better, mo more proactive pet parent, no matter how brightly the sun does shine. Thanks for me and Kiko, and I'm here for any questions you may have.
Well, thank you so much, Denise. That was really great and informative. I really appreciate you sharing all of your experience and I love seeing your puffs. That was great. <laughs> um, I don't see any questions at the moment. Okay. Amanda, do you see any? I don't see any right now. I don't think it was the really a question kind of thing. It was just me kind of preaching to the choir, but telling them, you know, to keep some things in mind for your pets this year and, you know, not be surprised if they're being lazy because you're being lazy. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a, a fair, a fair message. <laughs> and I do see a note that somebody's pup was barking when mine did. So see, they mimic each other and they mimic us. That was Luna. That was me writing to you. She heard your dog barking and she was down at the front door barking. How great is that? <laughs> uh, well, we, if there are no questions, I will leave it to the um, our, our, our fearless leader, Lisa, here. I, I can always find something to fill for a moment or we can say toodles. <laughs> Um, I, I think, I think we're good. So okay. we really appreciate your, your time. And I'm seeing some, some thank yous and kudos coming into the chat window. So thank you so much, Denise, for sharing your expertise. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to hearing from you again sometime down the road, not, not so far off. You betcha. My pleasure. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We truly appreciate you and we will see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.